Let's call the uh, Liquor Control Board to attention. First up is public comment. This is public comment on the Liquor Control Board. So we do our liquor licenses under that, and then we reason we move on to the select board. Public comment on the liquor board. Seeing none, approval of the agenda. We move we approve the agenda. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a Aye. the next agenda item is a first class liquor license for Weebird Bagel Cafe. First class is beer and wine, right? Beer and wine. No ice luge set up there. No, like that's that. third class. We don't need any of that. <laughs> um, and then the format you have in your packets is the the new sheet from um, the new application sheets from DLC. So if they look a little different, that's why those are changed. I guess it's more of an online system. That's what they're trying to move towards. So we don't even have a signature page. It looks like. Yeah, it was. It's very confusing. Uh, yeah, it was a very confusing first experience, <laughs> having done them all previously on hard copy. <laughs> yeah. We have a motion to approve this. I move we approve the <clears throat> first class liquor license. I'll second that. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Call the select board meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is anything that's not on the agenda for the select board. Seeing none, no step on the screen. We'll go on to approval of the agenda. Move that we approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 On to the consent calendar. This is meeting minutes from September and warrants. It's your turn, Perry. Motion to approve the consent calendar. <laughs> yeah. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next up is our business items. And first up is equipment proposals. So we've got, we sent this around a little while ago to go with this conversation. I'm going to throw one down, Larry. I'll try to pull one up on the screen if you'll forgive my reach. Yeah. I haven't done a share screen in a while, so if I'm technologically inept, that would be part of it. Um, so let's try to the thumbnail a little bit. So this gives you an overview, and I'll walk through what some of the small text is here. Um, yep. Not on the main. So yeah, so we've got we've got four pieces of equipment basically to to talk about. The first three tie into the conversation we had last month about a replacement of a pickup truck for highway, um, replacement of the one of the loaders, and then replacement of the vibratory roller. And so those are the numbers you see up there. The fourth piece that we've started to talk about too, based on age conditions and concerns about its durability and reliability, is a jetter that's primarily used by Chris and his crew in water wastewater. So there's some numbers, at least preliminarily, to talk about there and what that why that piece of equipment is important. And so we'll touch base on that and essentially what we're looking for from that conversation is to get it started. Move to approve. Whoop. In your Congress. I think we're I think we've got a little bit of feedback with yeah. there. Just go to um, the big one, right? Yeah, well that's the nails, but you can find them on there. Okay. Well let's try I don't see, I hear myself again, so I think we got it. Okay. So just to kind of walk through, in green on these sheets are the what are the currently recommended options. These are all paid for out of that highway equipment reserve. Um, there's a mixture of funding mechanisms that are at work here. Um, the truck purchase, which is the very top listing, is would be an outright purchase. So we just would use those reserve funds, make that purchase in this fiscal year and be done with it. The other two, given the useful life of the pieces of equipment and the cost and in trying to maximize the dollars that are in the equipment reserve, because if you'll recall, we purchased a dump truck out of that fairly recently as well. Um, so to leave a little bit in there, thinking ahead to next year, even though that'll probably have to be a more modest set of proposals in terms of equipment, there are already some ideas for that. Um, we, we can fit all of these pieces together um, in that footprint. So we're going to try to, if you can just, yeah, maybe over here. 
This one? here right now so okay so with the truck we looked at a couple of different options there were the extended cabs that's what we currently have right yes uh, yeah so we have an extended cab now we went with a bigger crew cab as part of the mix so that we could more easily fit um, department personnel we went with a, a slightly bigger truck in some of the modeling so that it have some more functionality when it comes to snow removal um, summer maintenance activities those types of things so the one that's recommended is a 2022 Ford F350. It's got a crew cab. Um, this one we have actually a credit with this dealer. So when you weigh out the total cost of that, take in the trade allowance for the 15 Silverado, is that what it is? Seven, yeah. Six, seven year old Chevy Silverado extended cab we'd be trading in. You've got that, plus we've got a $7,500 credit with the dealer. That credit, what we're proposing to do is essentially roll into that plow package add-on. So that's it's the plow, the frame, the wiring, and there's actually a spray-on bed liner that we've lumped into that. Mm -hmm. And so the purchase price, with all of those things included, is at that $49,525. So that gives us some of the different functionality that we'd be after, gives us a little more size, um, and still fit sort of within the vehicle fleet as we've imagined trying to use it. And if you skip down to the loader, this one gets a little more confusing. We had looked at lease financing options. The reason you see five years, and there's a note on the six-year one, Statute allows us to go up to five years, or as many as five years, um, before you have to go out for voter approval, and then it becomes more akin to bonded indebtedness. One vendor gave us six and seven year options. We showed the six year option just because they were closest in timeline, but if you did like one of those options and didn't want to go with the recommendation, we'd need to figure out when we could go to the voters to ask for those six year terms. Try to break it down into starting prices for the equipment. Um, these are loaders that should meet all of our needs there they were sized appropriately for that there are two different options for the caterpillar ones bigger than the other and the bigger one does what you think it would in comparison to the smaller one which is have a little more power um, and then we've shown some of the payment ranges those came right from the vendor and tried to break them out so you can see that the recommended one would be a five-year lease to own so at the end of it we'd pay a dollar and own that loader outright there are seven year warranty um, coverages on these pieces of equipment so we'd be done paying the debt service before the warranty ever ran out this would replace a loader that is about 26 years old we think 27 years old 97 yeah the loaders are pretty valuable pieces of equipment this one is up at the center garage correct would be yes. that one yeah and so we use this one for everything from loading trucks to snow removal to removing trees yeah so it's a, it's a pretty important frontline vehicle. There's another one down at the village, which we'll need to address at some point, too. It's not quite as old as this one. I think that's an 07, 08-ish, right? Yeah. Somewhere in there. Um, and still is in decent shape. So this would be a lease payment. We'd pay for it um, out of that highway reserve. We've used this mechanism before for everything from trucks to pieces of heavy equipment. Um, so it lets us get into this game, replace equipment. It's also, when we think, long-term capital planning. In order to get sort of where we want to be with equipment and vehicle replacement schedules, we're probably going to have to mix methods for a while. It'd be nice to get out of the debt game and be able to go straight to a save and purchase model, but that's going to take some time, take some catch-up. We're going to you know, get on a cycle where we trade in equipment when it has greater value. That lowers the price. So there's a little bit of, think of it as a staircase here. So this helps us get the equipment and vehicles we need while being mindful of how much is in that per resource, both currently and projected. And then the vibratory roller, same set of circumstances. You can see same five-year terms in this case, comparing the two, slightly lower payment on one. We are using that one highlighted in green currently, primarily for pothole patching. So we've rented it for the month um, as a way to try it out. If we do end up going with a recommendation, that rental fee will be applied to any of these lease payment or purchase prices at some point too. So there's, it's not, we get the service of it now and then there's a little bit of a loss leader, I guess you could think of it as. So those are the pieces there for that. For the three pieces of highway equipment, this was the conversation that started when we were looking mainly at an excavator. We figured out that we can go with a rental method there, get that for periods of time, schedule work around that. And so it hits quite a few different categories of equipment need. And so we made it all fit within the math that was available. Um, what was there? Okay. And made sure that if for some reason there is, there's still 
room for the truck if you know knowing that with finance department staffing issues we have lag sometimes in information there's enough of a safety cushion that if for some reason there's a lag there we're not going to be over any kind of a barrel we can afford everything we've committed to um, if we commit to these things okay any questions later no? what's the um on the pickup trucks were those diesels or are those gas um, the three, the 3500 GMC was a diesel. Um, the F350 is the 73 gas motor. Okay. To the spec sheets. Right now is about a three dollar gallon savings in fuel cost. Yes, like but six nineteen. I'm not a big fan of diesel pickup trucks in those capacities. I mean, of gas pickup trucks. So. <clears throat> I would opt to pay a little bit more and end up with a GMC diesel than I would a Ford gas job. That's just my opinion. You have thoughts, Tom? Uh, no, I mean, I was blown away a little bit at the price difference just for the diesel. I mean, you look at the GMC and it's just like, that's just the truck, you know? Not including the plow. I mean, we do unfortunately use our plows a lot, so to try to keep an older plow from the older truck to put on a new truck doesn't really make sense to me. But um, I, yeah. So the difference is about fifteen thousand. Yes. To go to the. The only reason I really didn't want to go with the diesels, I mean, I've heard, I mean, obviously everyone has nightmares with the DEF and the electronics with the diesels, you know. I mean, some people have no problems, some people have a lot of problems, you know. Um, and that goes the same with the gas motor as well. So I just figured there was less things going on under the hood with the gas job. Just by the aftermarket and black market deleted. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 Well, I own six of those Duramaxes, and I can tell you that very minimal problems with any of them, and I've got them from 2007 clear up to 2021. So I'm a really big fan of Duramax diesels. And I realize it's a little bit more money, but I think you'll find that the power, especially if you're going to use it for plowing, I think you'd find you'd be better, better served with that pickup truck than you would be a Ford gas truck. With, with the plow, we'd be recycling the old plow to put on. So say we went with the GMC, we'd be using existing plow frame to try to fit to this, or we'd have to replace the plow as well? I think that with the trade-in value we have on the existing truck we have now, I mean, majority of the, va the value they gave us between, I mean, we had a trade-in value of 11000 from one and 9000 from the other. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much just what they're giving you a trade-in on the plow. There's, I mean, okay. the, trucks, the truck we have now is pretty rough. I mean, lack of you know, being taken care of and whatnot, you know, previous years. So I think that's a pretty shot of the value of what they've given us. So we'd need another nine to 11 for plow for, for uh, the GMC or? My personal opinion, I wouldn't place the plow if you're gonna put it on a new truck. This is trying to think about yeah. what everything includes. Right. Mm -hmm. That's an element that I'll, I'll have to fit. So you're actually, you're, you're probably closer to the 75,000 to go with the diesel option. Is it worth 25000 Perry? Well, in my opinion it would be, but it's not my money here, it's the town's money, so I guess, you know, if you want to save some money, fine, but if I was buying those two trucks, there's no way I'd touch that for you. Because it's a gas job, and I just think that that's my opinion is that that's a mistake. I don't own any gas trucks except for one pickup truck I bought in 2013, and I wish I'd never bought that one. And that's a GMC, too. But it's just the gas trucks just don't have the, the power or the longevity that you're going to find with diesels. So if you go look online right now and see what used GMC Duramaxes are worth, you'd be shocked. I mean, I can literally sell most of the trucks I've got for more than I paid for them when I bought them. Right. The only reason I really wanted to go with the Ford is because I like the aluminum body, you know, just to help from the, you know, minimize the rust in a little bit because 
you know, we are in the field, and I know they're still going to corrode. It's just going to corrode from the inside out. But have you asked Lebanon if they can get you a diesel? I have. Like I mean, months out. That truck hasn't even arrived yet. That's not going to be here till like the beginning of November. Um, they've been pretty decent with us, and I think we did put a hold on, at least put a name on it. That way, we didn't get rid of it. You know, because I mean, they're selling as fast before they're even coming in. So. Um, GMC said it would be March, maybe before we could get a you know a truck. What we were looking at getting, I mean. So maybe we need to ask Lebanon about getting a diesel, right. and see what those two compare at. Right. Could do that. Yeah, I mean none of these trucks are available right now, right? They're all sitting in queue someplace. Yeah, the what is it? The Ford is built and it should be here. He said in less than two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Is it? Could we get inf more information, like we're talking about, and and do uh, some sort of a an email decision, or so? Because it sounds like if we do decide we want this truck that's going to be around in two weeks, that we're going to need to make a decision pretty soon right, before our next meeting. Mm -hmm. Is there some some way we can? We may want to have the conversation and see if. Because we do have a sort of a hold on this one, maybe there's a way to essentially roll that <coughs> over into a theoretical diesel model if we had to, if there was one available to hold the consideration open. Yeah, they'll but, do that. They'll they'll swap it. This one will be sold before it arrives in the yard six times over. Right. Yeah. Whether we take it or not. So. Right. I just talked to somebody. There's they have to put them in inventory, even if you've ordered them, and before it even arrived in the yard, they have people calling saying they want it. Right. Crazy, you just can't get them. Right, but it sounds like we would be able to get this one. Yeah, this one right. we've this got one has a, right Yeah, now. this one has a so, name on it if we chose to take it. So that's it. that's worth something. Otherwise, you're looking at waiting until March at the earliest. Right. Um, <coughs> and is is the truck that we have now gonna? Could it make it to March? Like we would be able it can. It, the inspection runs out in December. I mean, we it needs a lot of body work in order to pass inspection. Needs, I'm sorry, in, in December? Yes. Like this December? Like, yes. in, like in two months, the next inspection? Yes. Okay, so we can't wait until March to get, a new, to get a new truck. We need to replace this truck before December, before it's inspected. Sure. To get an inspection? Invest in Bondo? Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like if you can go back to Lebanon and ask them what the time what is for a for diesel. Us. Yeah. If it's not... It turns out the yeah the diesel's in March too, and it's the sort of the gas now or the <laughs> diesel later. Then that might shape the decision as well. Yeah, but I mean, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like if there's if there's not a diesel available, we don't have much of a choice. We have to replace this truck soon. Or I heard the other day that 30 percent of vehicles haven't been inspected right. that are out there on the road right now because people variety of reasons whether they can't pass it or they're just not doing it or so we just run the risk we live on the wild <laughs> side a little bit for a few months and yeah, sure get what I'll we want right comfortable no making that as my <laughs> official position and we're going to run a Oh, well, how they operate and put stickers course, on isn't the course, board's decision. Of course, this is assuming that nobody in the room tells anybody. Right? <laughs> yeah. Or the recording doesn't go anywhere. Well, the recording doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> well, we don't operate the day-to-day -day stuff. We don't need to know that, right? <laughs> we didn't tell them what to do. So when Kim records the motion, it's going to be to live on the wild side? Exactly. Dreamy <laughs> <We're, we're, laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go on to the next one. So there was the Hello, Jetter. Um, the no, Chris the loader. We got oh, a loader and a vibrator, to vi vibratory roller to decide on. I don't know. I'm just too quick on the drum. <laughs> Any questions on either of those? They're very happy with the roller. They brought it down here and didn't try to get me on it. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't I want did, to play? I did, but I, uh, I figured... I don't want to pay for everything else I hit, so. <laughs> well, if he doesn't want to ride, I'll take a ride. That sounds like fun. you got to yeah. operate it. Go ahead and operate it. Yeah, I was going to say no rides. You just got to run it. Just run it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Those are pretty easy. 
It's one of those. Okay. It's one of those hand what, compacted ones. Yeah, that's one a little nicer. A little nicer. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. Do we want to make a motion to proceed with the loader and the roller? I do that. Um, will that we proceed with the loader and the roller purchase? No second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Now we have Chris's equipment. The Jetter. Yeah. Sounds very exciting. So, our Jetter was purchased in, well, it was built in 99. It was purchased in 2000. Um, what, it, for anyone that doesn't know, um, if we have a sewer plug, or actually it works pretty well with culverts too, um, it shoots water out of a hose, and it'll pull itself up, and it'll clean out the line so that everything will flow the proper direction. Um, it's getting to that point where parts are hard to find because it's got a Ford 2.4 liter engine in it that they don't make anymore. Um, so we were actually starting this discussion. We were going to get some numbers and come for budgetary purposes to start the discussion. And then the jetter decided to have an attitude. Um, it blew a seal on the pump. Um, it works, but not very well. Um, we reached out to the company that originally sold us the jetter. They no longer make that model with that pump. Um, they can rebuild it, but it was kind of one of those things, we can rebuild it and there's no guarantee that it's going to work. Um, and that's going to cost us about fifteen to 20000 to get them up here to rebuild the pump. And you cannot buy a replacement pump that fits in there. You have to do a bunch of modifying the whole system. Um, so just on the note of that we were already kind of in the thought process and we would started talking with Trevor about, you know, coming up with a budget plan and stuff to replace it. And now that things are kind of staring us in the face on it, um, we've put together a bunch of numbers. Um, still trying to figure out, you know, if who's got what for financing options. Um, a couple of them have given us quotes, but they have to reach out and find out what their least financing options and stuff like that would be. Um, right now it currently ranges from 90000 to about 120000 uh, depending on the models and what kind of specs they each have. Um, if we don't have a jetter, it requires us to contract it out. Um, right now, Pump Tech um, does not have a jetter of their own. So we don't have that next door capability like we used to have with Wind River. And Wind <clears> River <throat> is about 500 to to $1,000 per time that we need that machine, depending on how long we have it for. And that's like a day rate, hourly rate type deal. How often do you use it? When it's functioning properly, we use it you know, depends on where we are in our maintenance schedule. You know, we'll take like a month and we'll go through and clean a whole bunch of lines. And then it'll, it will sit for a little bit. But it also varies on backups, how many baby wipes people are flushing, how much grease people are putting down the line. Sometimes you can use it a lot in a short period of time. And sometimes it does sit for about a month. But it's one of those machines that... So you would spend at least 30000 a year in rentals. <laughs> At a thousand dollars a day, more than likely for thirty days. Yes. In four years. Yeah. There's your hundred and twenty thousand versus twenty two years that you've. Right. You've had it. Yep. What's the finances of the? It looks like they've got district. the waste. Yeah, it'd be the wastewater fund reserve. Minutes. There's plenty in there. We'd have to tease out everything just to make sure we're not missing something given the transitions, but it looks like at 120. Whether it would be a lease payment, certainly at a 40 plus or whatever it would be for the five years. That's some really good math. Yeah, say 30, 25 to 30 per year for that. Um, it seems like it could absorb it. That would be part of this exercise. If you're okay with us fully modeling it out, we'll make sure that we pull those pieces apart. Yeah. I don't think you got much choice. No. It <laughs> doesn't feel like it. Yeah. Especially if you need it 30 days for maintenance plus 
to have it immediately available when you got a yeah it does really work good to borrow to clean out culverts when they're plugged <laughs> <laughs> a couple of the new ones have heat <laughs> <laughs> have what, Chris? Heat. they have heat options like you mean they you heat like up you water, heat the water. Oh, wow. and actually it's funny because some of the more affordable options have the heat whereas the real expensive one does not I thought that was interesting that's interesting yeah yeah, I can see how that could be useful in the winter. Yeah, well, John can speak to how it cleans out a nice up culvert. Yeah. See, the last one was just so far. It was just it was so cold that a lot of culverts were froze. So we use that. And it worked, but it took a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to go and look at these and figure out yep. what the financial side looks like? Come back with a recommended model and funding source or funding and again, plan? if you need it before the next meeting, we can handle it the same way we yep. talked about doing the pickup. Sure. All right. Any other equipment? I've always wanted a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> That's the discussion when you get home. <laughs> wrong, wrong location, Trevor. In that case, I'll just write no. <laughs> <laughs> no discussion needed. All right. Does that give you what you need, Chris? What's that? Does that give you what you need? Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Next up is the discussion about the Randolph Center water system and fire district number one. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. So I don't know if the Water Waste Water Committee wants to provide the intro, if you guys want me to try it real quickly. This is a continuation of a conversation, I guess I'll just launch into it, um, conversation that started at the Water Waste Water Committee level with uh, Prudential Committee members from Fire District Number 1, they're split on me there, um, about uh, some of the long-term operating and other needs of that system. So that was kind of a generalized conversation on where the Fire District is, what it sees its current needs are, future needs are. Um, leaving that conversation as a potential next step was to check in with the select board about what is everybody's thoughts, feelings uh, about putting in time and effort into continuing that conversation. Kind of make sure that if we're going to dedicate some staff resources to it, we set them aside and make sure that we, we create that time for it. So it's really about um, having a, a little bit of a conversation now and seeing if you want to dig into additional research, spend some time working through all the various questions that could come with whatever arrangement would come out of those conversations um, from assisting to something more comprehensive. Um, so to provide you with a primer, I guess, we've got some folks here who can talk about certainly the fire district side, Chris, in terms of operating, Larry was in that committee conversation. So I don't know if I've missed anything in the quick summary there. That's the quick summary. All right. Um, well, that's easy. So, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we spent quite a bit of time talking about it in the Water Wastewater Committee. And, and as we talk more and more, we, we realize that the information that we really need to have to make any kind of recommendation, um, but we just didn't have that information. And that it would require some resources to get that information resources which the committee is you know not able to um, authorize and so we decided we need to bring it to the select board to have a, a little discussion and um, talk about what we're willing as a town to put into resource wise to acquire the information that we might need um, to bring this further along okay um Maybe somebody wants to talk about what you would like to see the town do. Raise this up. Sure, you don't need it even. Okay. You don't have to come forward or right. just okay. do whatever you want. Whatever makes you comfortable. All right. So my name is John Lenz. I'm the chair of the Prudential Committee for the Fire District. With us tonight is Patrick Giordano from Gifford. And online is David Rubin from BTC. He couldn't be here because of a medical situation. And also Bill DeFlorio and Bob DeLeo from the fire district. We talked, we actually we proposed last year to the town uh, manager's office uh, a discussion about the uh, idea of joining 
forces in some way to uh, assist us because we are a volunteer organization. We have uh, folks that are aging, including myself, and we have we don't have volunteers. So uh, we do have revenue. We have revenue from our water sales, and so we approached the town about that. We had a meeting in September, September 13th or 16th, here with the Water Wastewater Committee to talk about the uh, this idea. We reached a point in that discussion where it's a number analysis that needs to be done on the town's part. We did provide our financials, and uh, it was clear to us, actually to, to the Water Wastewater <coughs> Committee, and I think Larry was there, on behalf of that, that this needed to be brought to the select board to get approval to spend the time, I think by Chris and by uh, Trevor, to do the, the, that side of the analysis, to be able to continue the discussion. So that's why we're here. What role are you hoping the town does? What, do, what are the options that you're... Because that'll make a difference in what we actually think we need for data or information. Right. So the role would start with uh, operations and maintenance. So the day-to-day -day operating of the system. And also there are the financial aspects of uh, issuing the invoices and, and collecting the payments. Uh, and that's, that's on the fire district side. So we have about 52 customers. We have half of the Randolph Center water system. That system is a state designated number 5177 water system. VTC has the other half, uh, about half in terms of pipelines. Uh, they have the water storage tank. We actually have uh, 50,000 or about 20% of the capacity of that storage tank allocated by the state. And we're looking at, uh, because we are a volunteer organization and we don't have volunteers, uh, <clears throat> to get those services that need to be done, uh, done. And we've looked at private entities to do that, uh, but we uh, they're not particularly as promising as the town. This is really an extension of what the town already does for the water wastewater, so it seemed logical that it would be an expansion of what's already done there. And, and so that's the minimum. Uh, if there needed to be some greater uh, role by the town, I guess we could consider that, but we're looking at the operations from a day to day water system and then the financial aspects. And, and am I missing anything? But you have a fund large enough to cover the costs of that? Well, or is that something you need to figure out what that would do to your rate to change to a a model that you well, had. We don't we don't know what the, the town uh, water wastewater system would need to have for compensation for that work. Mm -hmm. We know what we get for income, but I think the next step was to find out what the town felt it needed to have for compensation for doing this extension. Uh, we that's, that's essentially what I understand of, of where we are. Mm -hmm. So you, you provided the financials. Did you provide anything that gives us an idea of the condition of the system yes. to know kind of what the yep. maintenance needs and Yep, we've done an asset and... management plan that was done two years ago, and that uh, is in the package that we gave. And so we don't have any immediate pressing needs, nothing uh, hanging on by a, a, a Band-Aid, uh, but we have aging pipes particularly. They're pipes that are reaching 75 years, so they're on a list of the higher priority repairs or actually replacements. So uh, we actually, in that asset management plan, have a, uh, have a schedule that was prepared as far as the financing for that through a bond. So we, we're ready with the asset management plan, or the system is, to start going to a design for the replacement of the the next next generation of uh, infrastructure that needs to be brought to a more modern life. Is that a lot of it that needs to be replaced? No, no I mean uh, it's in the plan. I mean you can take a look at it and decide you know what you consider a lot, but it's uh, I don't I don't think it's 
I mean, it's not all. It's I don't. Does anybody remember what the percentages of the types that we're thinking would be first? Essentially, we looked at a schedule, prioritized the, the risks, the criticality, and the age in terms of when it needs to be replaced, or our engineer did, and they came up with a schedule of what we should be prioritizing for repairs. Or replacement. I shouldn't say repairs. These are just replacements. We don't have frequent breaks. Uh, I think we were saying that we have less than one per, per year, typically. But we don't want to get... I'm sure the way you don't want to get to any infrastructure that's breaking a lot and you'd say we're spending more time and money fixing than we are just replacing this stretch of pipe. Yep. As far as what's happening on the Morgan Orchards campus and the future of the assisted living potentially being added to that, how does that affect what you're doing in Randolph Center? Has that already been considered in the infrastructure that's on that property or do you have to consider that as you move forward? So they are our customer, right. or their user, right. and we're not looking at changes in our system to account for any specific changes in what Gifford's doing. So that's not going to affect your replacements as far as volume, water volume, and so forth? There, well, if it's a question of what the I'm what, asking about growth. growth. Yeah. How does All that affect what you have to do? We don't know what that growth is. We don't have yeah. a specific request from Gifford that I'm aware of okay. on the growth. We know that there's some plans for expansion, but we don't know what those specifically are. What we're looking at is maintaining our current system what you in, have in now, the current right? state. Right. Okay. If you have a large development that's going to take place, any growth needed in the system goes lots of times as a conversation with the developer. Okay. And they actually invest in that usually and, yeah. and provide. Yeah something if it's going to drastically change your system. Yeah. So, and I, I don't know that that would be part of this analysis because we're not looking at any of that. Right, okay. Like we have nothing to go on, nothing okay. to make that judgment on. Right, okay. Okay. I'm only concerned that we are not fully staffed right now and we are kind of piecing together to keep everything operating here right now. I don't know if the timing of this is great to reassign folks that are already reassigned to make this a priority, but, you know, I would say once we have a finance director on that could dig into this, it would make sense and have that person, once they kind of understand their functions and what they got there, to to sit down with Chris and look at, you know, this, I think the asset management plan is going to play in key here because somewhere you need to understand also kind of what that means. Like if this is what you're looking at for um, work that has to be done, what is the, you know, what are you looking at for, for requirements? I mean, you're going to have to do it anyway, right? So right. what is your, somewhere in there you need to be building some type of finance model that looks at not just keeping the existing functioning, but doing these replacements. And then what does that look like if you're having to hire somebody to operate it and manage it for you? Patrick, do you have anything you want to add or bring up? No, I mean, you know, here from Gifford Medical and Patrick Giordano, uh, facilities director there, obviously we have a vested, vested interest in the system mm -hmm. with our campus that's there. Um, I think they, they've done an, an excellent job with maintaining the system that they have, upgrades with pump systems, et cetera. But again, looking to the future, um, you know, knowing that you've got a, a, a department that's doing a very good job here locally, you know, it would it lends itself to that, um, you know, in the future. And in, and again, as that area in Randolph Center continues to expand, there's potential there as well. But, yeah. Yeah, I, I just am looking at both sides of this, and the town's going to want to know what we're going into, right? What are we committing for resources and what has to be done? But the users up there should want to know, too, like, what's our, what does this look like? You know, and I think that's part of what this discussion is looking yeah. to spur that interest to continue down that pathway with the town. Yeah, and the only concern I have right now is our staffing level as we're bringing on some new managers and getting them adjusted and kind of finding a finance person to dig into that role because I think the finance side is pretty important. And then on Chris's side, 
him having time to dig into kind of that asset management plan and what does that look like and how do you get numbers around it. You know, it's easy to say we need to replace 20% of the system, but what does that really mean? Yeah, and again, I think looking into that today and, and having that interest mm -hmm. to then partner with the Prudential Committee to look at that together with what they provided and then just move down that pathway, just a starting point. Yep. And I and maybe Larry and Perry feel differently, but I'm just concerned that we don't have the staff to pull off what they have to do today to keep the town functioning. You're not to alone. Commit to that <laughs> project right now, and I just I'm not saying it's not important, and I'm not saying we're not interested, and that we shouldn't go down that path. I'm just saying it probably isn't going to happen tomorrow. We also have Dave Race. I mean, uh, not Dave Race. Dave Rubin from BTC. I don't know, Dave, can you hear us? Is there anything you'd like to contribute from your side as the co cooperator and owner of this entity? Only that the only that the fire district is a value partner, uh, and we have a long history of working closely together. Um, I would say I would add that we also have done a recent uh, AMP analysis. Uh, on our side of the infrastructure as well, so we have new data there. Um, I guess that's about what I would add there, John. Okay. Um, I think, so So the, this asset management plan was actually undertaken by the fire district, but it included VTC, so we did the whole f number 5177 water system. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's important to remember is it's uh, we're actually part of the town, mm -hmm. and so uh, it just started as a volunteer operation when things were in three villages. But and I think around 1850, if I'm right, mm -hmm. and the fire district itself has been around as that municipal entity since 1939, and it's I think, gone to the point where volunteers just don't exist. <coughs> So I think we're in this together as far as being in Randolph, Randolph Center. So we, you know, we, we think it's, I think it's, and I think we all think that it's very important that we do move ahead with this because if we lose people, we don't have people that will run this. It's very welcoming to hear you say the fire district feels like they're part of the town and one because usually we get up against them and they're like, we're independent and we're our own and well, so it's good to hear the... That's not the, the case. In that. That's not the case. I mean, we're you know we're here. Uh, you know, we serve a we serve a chunk because that's where our system is, and uh, we really you know we, we think it make it, it seems to me to make some good business sense if you just look at it from a business point of view that we're we're not a large piece being added on. We're actually a relatively small piece, I think, compared to what, what's already there, and so there's some sharing of resources, you know, staff excuse me, equipment, you know, synergies and uh, buying power and that sort of thing. Just, you know, keep in mind that when you point to the water, wastewater, that's a whole separate piece of the town. Right. It's in its own fund and the users pay for that. So while it's part of the town, it's definitely, it's user-based. And um, even when we bond for stuff, the bond payments are paid by that user group. And so we would need to be looking at this the same way, you know, that this is a, whether it's a separate entity or how it's, however it's managed, that that's a user group. Right. We're aware of that. And we're not going to, yeah. We're just the way the fire district is, actually. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're this entity that is self-contained. So, so that's why we think it's important. You know, we started on this. We've been at this for a while. We, you know, we, we talked to VTC at first, and uh, the idea of maybe uh, they can expand, but you know, there are a lot of changes that happen with the state college system. So we've approached the town, and we've, uh, and we've been at this for over a year, um, frankly. And so uh, we think, I think it's important uh, from everybody's point of view to, to get some numbers at least to see where this, this can lead. If the answer is it can't lead anywhere, uh, that there's a combination of, of things done between the water, wastewater, and town and us. We need to know that soon. 
you know, not to pressure you, but you know, uh, I don't know how much effort it is. Do you have any sense of how much effort this would take to do this number crunching? Uh, I don't. I, it, we'd be starting from scratch, and it would be something, frankly, that based on our staffing capacity, you're talking about me right now in terms of who that's on. Um, yeah, and I mean, this this at a minimum, and I'm not again, not minimum. I'm not saying it's not important. This is at minimum the 58th thing in line right now, um, including the water supply project we've already started that we have to really be managing all the different funding streams, finding the funding for, and getting moving. So it's just we're not talking about a little bit into some open capacity. We're talking about more on top of more as we try to patch it through. So not knowing fully what the exercise is, not having mapped it, and then being mindful of this. Chris and I really doing the different pieces. Uh, I don't know. Well, okay. What do you have in, in you, when you look at your group? How do you like set your rates and do all that? Does somebody do an analysis of that to figure out what your rate structure is? And yes. And yeah, I mean, over the years, we raised our rates uh, for the first time, I think, in 25 years, maybe three or four years ago, looking to catch up. Um, and, and, and yes, so, so we have this Prudential Committee looks at the finances on a regular basis. We look at what's, what's uh, necessary to make sure that we're staying in, on the positive. And so have you done like a five-year look? That's or? in the asset management plan. Okay. And, um, I haven't seen it, so I don't know what's okay. in it. Yeah, yeah, so that, you know, there, there's, there's a look forward for that. Um, it's a matter of, you know, I think the same thing that the town's going through, which is people. But you're looking at the people here. And well, you're looking at the people here. <laughs> right, right. So, so I guess, we're, you know, as I said, we are all in this together. Uh, I suppose if you could tell us what you needed to know, we could try and put something together on our, on our own. In other words, we, we can, we're happy to do some legwork. Uh, but we're... We need to move ahead, you know. I just want to be really direct about that. We do need to move ahead uh, with some things, and so uh, if you told us we needed X done, and we could see if we could get those resources together. I mean, we do have uh, some knowledgeable people with finance. Who has the the asset management plan? Did you get that? If it was it? sent in, it's probably, yeah, probably happened. Yeah. I think we both got the email yeah. with it, but it's one of those things where, you know, it's not. Well, I'm, not, I'm just wondering who has it. If somebody yeah. forwards it to me, yeah, I'll look at well, it and see what's so in there. there. It was already sent, yeah, we probably, what I, we we need. It's a big plan. I mean, it's a big document. It, it's mapping all the, <laughs> all the infrastructure, but it's, the, the, the short part is. There's a summary that says this is a replacement schedule, this is a. Right. Exactly. All the, those right, right. It talks yeah. about how to get financing. Right now, I think the other thing that's important to bring up is, yeah. as you know, uh, there, are, yeah. there are funds available like there have been for a long time and probably won't be for a, for a long time. Yeah. And so uh, now's the time to start looking at replacing that hardware, you know, that, that infrastructure. And the fire district's not eligible to apply in most cases, no, right? No, we are. Oh, well, we can, okay. but but so yeah, these, are the the people, town. these are the people. You know, yeah. you know, I have a full time other job, um, and so we're we're looking to to spread the resources, and, and and we've talked to private entities, but they're really not set up to do that. And and if we could pay them, then it would seem that we could pay the town. So that's why we came to the town first. Okay. <clears throat> Um, yeah, if somebody send me the AMP, I'll look at it and see if it's got kind of what we would need to, to build out something, and that's what I can offer you. Okay. Today, well, I can't I, give you any other dates because I think we're in a, we have some staffing issues too to work through here, but I'm willing to look at the AMP and see what's in it and if it's got the data that would show it, and then we can, I'll come chat with you or whatever, we can figure out kind of what the time commitment would be for somebody to do the operations and maintenance and I gotta believe the billing is minor right once it's set up it's like billing the rest of the system it just would have some type of coding difference to well to also there are 18 uh, users 
of the sewer system that get read that get their meters read on our system. Mm -hmm. So out of the 52 or so, there's already you know there are already folks coming up to do readings. So it, I think you're right that the 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 financial billing and that sort of thing is small, and we can we can sit down and talk to you, to Chris and others, about what time we spend on it. In other words, what, what the effort is. And I, I think that's already happened a little bit. I think we had the conversation in September about what that might take in terms of how many hours a week would be added on. So, so we realize that there's more, uh, there's more that your, your water wastewater system would need to do, but we have revenue. <coughs> Uh, to, to compensate for that. And I think the question is, how much revenue do you need? Right. Well, it's, if it's a standalone entity, then you have to, you'll have to track your time and charge your hours into that account. And so, you know, it'll be, what we need to be able to tell you is about X number of hours by these different employees at this rate is what's going to get charged into that account. The same way we do now, you track your time and you charge to the water district or the sewer district or, you know, Either sometimes it's the highway. We yeah. Highway. Yeah. Right. Yep. Back and forth. Yeah. So I, right. I think the accounting system's in play there yeah. to do it. It's that if I was on your side, I wouldn't want to go into it blind. I'd not want to know, you know, about how many hours is somebody going to be charging that your user group is going to have to. Cover, right? You want to know what it's going to cost. What's it going to cost you if you went with that's, the model for well, the town? Well, that's a question, right? Yep. Yep. What's your contingency plan if you all are gone tomorrow? What happens? Does the water stop flowing? Or the water will still run because you know th this doesn't need uh, uh, somebody there every day. But uh, there isn't a plan. That, that's the problem. Right. You know, there, there isn't a plan. I mean, we, we're not a municipality that has... CTC and the hospital will be stepping up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Have you put out a query for new members? Yes. Nothing's happened? No. no. Interesting. All right. So we'll get the well, plan and look at it. Center, so. And then I'm see where that sure goes. Is that kind sure. of what you guys committed to in there? This is our contingency plan. Oh, we have to really to the meeting. You know, they wanted that yesterday. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Does so that work? Enough? Okay. Yeah, I'll right. uh, get my hand. We'll get a hold of the plan and look at it <coughs> and, and, and digest it. And please feel free to call on us if there's something that's not clear or. Um, oh, I will. There's not enough information. <laughs> you know, that, anything okay. else, Dave? Anything else? No. Yeah, just you know, you know the two big entities that we are mm -hmm. connected to, and so that, yep. that's why they're here and, and why that's important overall to the to the community. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Next up is Bethany Church wastewater bill adjustment request. So, uh, um, so they had some high bills randomly, kind of. And they weren't real sure what had happened. We they called on us. One of my guys went and did a leak inspection. I don't know if I dated when he went in, but he didn't find anything at that point in time. A couple of toilet issues, um, but they had speculated someone had used an outside spigot and left it on. Um, so that's what we kind of ran with. Well, they got another one. They went one quarter where they were normal. And then they got another quarter where they were really high, a uh, total of $2,600, $2,575. And um, so they called us again. I said, let me get back in there. Luckily, someone had, luckily for me finding it, that someone had used the outside spigot and it was a frost free valve that was mounted the wrong direction. So the water had collected in the bottom on the inside and froze and popped the pipe. So anytime they turned it on, it sprayed water inside the basement. And they like it pressure washed the boards, all kinds of stuff. And there was visible water on the floor when I had gone in. That's what led us to really finding it uh, right away. Um, so I we brought up their past history usage and 
other than the two quarters that where they had the really high bills, they were always right around the minimum or less than the minimum. Their average was below the minimum. Um, so that leads to the adjustment. Um, I wrote it down here. I'm not going to. Uh, for of 123 units, which drops them down to the $1,537.50, which is just the wastewater portion of the bill. It's unused wastewater. It didn't go down the drain. It physically went on a dirt floor basement. Okay. And your committee looked at that? They were good with it? Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Anybody? Got any questions, Perry? Motions? No, I'm also. I make a motion to uh, give a reduction of 1537.50. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, New England Precision Discharge Agreement. So, as you guys recall, a few months ago, um, we discussed the lead and copper limits concerns that came up. That was kind of the big factor. Um, the committee wanted to revisit the uh, discharge agreement just to update the parameters. Also, the state wanted the most recent document for the pretreatment program uh, permit. So by doing that, we kind of adjusted some things. Um, other than some clerical error thing, clerical pieces throughout the agreement, um, the biggest notorieties are an increase on the BOD and the TSS um, demand from 16 pounds to 45 pounds and 42 pounds. Those numbers are the 5% max load before the state trigger. That's just kind of what the state, they cannot do any more than that. Um, they pay a surcharge for anything that goes over the 250 milligram uh, number that comes in as the, part of the testing. So therefore, they would, anything above and beyond that, they pay us a surcharge anyways. This just caps them at they can't go over 45 pounds per day, and that's for the wastewater plant specs. That's the maximum for 5% if they were to do that. I don't believe they'll be anywhere near that once they get their new system online to address the lead and copper, but those are the numbers the committee felt like they wanted to go with. Okay. We're good with that one, too? Yep, we took, <coughs> we took a lot of... Um, um, information from Chris and from the state over the past few meetings, taking looking at this issue closely, and uh, yeah, we feel comfortable that this is a good plan. Great. Any questions, Barry? Nope, I'm good with that. Entertain a motion. We'll move that we I'll make a motion to uh, <laughs> authorize the town manager sign on, the behalf, on, on our behalf for the discharge agreement with. New England Precision. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. To help you finish out your list, <laughs> we'll <laughs> skip over the next one and uh, we have an appointment to the Water Wastewater Committee of uh, Maurice Smith. Right, that's not for more ham. <laughs> then you get to work with them too. That's right. Um, uh, Maury is a longtime member of our community here in Randolph, and he's also a member of the Water and Wastewater District as a, as a consumer user. And um, he are, has already started to attend meetings and uh, is very excited about prep work. Being, on, being on the committee. He thinks it's pretty interesting stuff, which I wholeheartedly agree. It's, good. it's a great committee. And, um, it's a good thing people like different things. It, 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 it's, it's an unsung committee, it really is. All sorts of cool stuff comes up. So anyway, um, we very much are, are in need of additional members um, so that we can make sure that we always have uh, a quorum and additional you know, uh, eyes on, on what we're doing. So uh, I, I would very much like to see Maury Smith uh, approved as a full-time member of our committee. That was a motion, right? It was indeed. What do you think, Barry? I'm fine. Larry's going to make a motion, right? He already did. <laughs> I seconded that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. 
Opposed? Motion carries. There you go. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Evening. You too. Oh, let's see. We're going to go back one to the East Valley Community Group use of the community hall. Um, so we've kind of been in, out, in, out here with this. The latest question is on whether what it would take or if there was the ability for them to use the hall three seasons of the year. Um, <clears throat> and that included, uh, there was an email that came out and it included them doing some upgrades for ADA accessibility and the bathrooms. But the question before they go and do a business plan and do all that work is would the town allow them to use the building three seasons of the year? The only concern I have is we know there's no insulation. We know the windows are, are not good. Um, who's paying to heat the space beyond? You know, we do minimal space now, right? So the office for the fire department and the bathroom is in there for the fire department. So we heat a minimum space. But, you know, is, is the town willing to take on the cost of heating it or the cost of doing repairs so you could heat it or you know and, and where does that discussion belong I'm not sure that excuse me if we hang on just a minute Betsy the okay. um, <coughs> I'm not sure where that conversation needs to, to happen or what it needs but I you know I don't know that we have all the information and I think that group is still working on a business plan and and what that would look like but you know where does this is going to keep coming back as we've seen it's we're not doing it we're doing it we're doing it. so um you know does it go to the budget committee to talk about prioritizing does it where does it you know what does that look like what 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 does it look like to heat that space you know and what is that cost currently and what would that be if you heated the I gotta believe it just sucks the fuel to try to heat that space in the winter time or the cold months but as a matter of fact I know it does back in the day but I can't we can't hear you we, we'd have to go into the to the bills just into the invoices because we don't break heat out that way right now in terms of in a way where you could easily select a report and say it was this amount in this fiscal year. So it's not a difficult exercise, especially with Kayla on board. That could be something we could pull out in terms of get a multi-year kind of average as it's been in this holding pattern to at least say since we've owned it. Or even go back yeah, as far as to when we took ownership a few years ago, this is what we've spent each fiscal year on. I think it's propane might be the heat source. I forget which, but we could pull them that way. but. We'd have to, a little, little bit of investigative work, but not anything too onerous. But that usage is only heating to a certain temp. Yep. And only for very minimal use. Yeah. You know, I don't know how you then use that data to figure out what would it cost to. Mm -hmm. And I think, honestly, we, one of the things we talked about, the, the office space in the bathroom for the fire department is, is also what keeps that entanglement open. They had their own facility, say, um, in a meeting room over there. We probably winterize the building each year and or even have held it that way whenever the mm -hmm. insurance and safety related closure came down. So that, that you know it's it's that element is the, the reason that we do heat to that minimal standard uh, currently. So can Harold do some look into like what what that like what does it mean if we continue where we are now and expand the time in which the building was available versus what it would cost if we put in um, a bathroom and meeting area into the existing fire station to be able to to, to separate those two and you know, remember some of the conversation that's taken place in all these was about separating the buildings anyway and letting a nonprofit or somebody else take that building over and do what they want to with it 
So, you know, it may not be just an exercise in information. It may be kind of step one and in, in that. But, you know, the, the problem is, you know, like, your power, all that is tangled in through that building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one actually runs through one to get to the other, yeah. right? Yeah. So your, your power lines and your communication lines, yeah. you know, those would all have to be part of it if you're going to look at giving making it so the fire station is completely independent of that building. It seems to me like if you were... Uh, Andrea, hang on just a second. Okay. It's board discussion right now. But then you got to... We'll have to pull that septic permit too. Mm -hmm. But I believe when we permitted that, we intentionally permitted it to be able to put a bathroom in that fire station. If I'm not mistaken. Were you around for that? Before my time. I think we did. I think we did a larger capacity to tie the, be able to tie the two in together. Which it's not going to matter, right? Because there's no leach field. you got to pump it anyway. So Yeah. yeah we just went through that exercise for... It was a little less than three thousand dollars, I think, to do that recently. Thanks. Training. Um, yeah. Yes, Betsy. So our question, which I guess is new, was that <clears throat> initially we thought we had to really fix the foundation and everything in order to get back in the hall. In order to use the hall again for anybody to use it again it's really the fire marshal code and the ada that has to be fixed and so our question was if all of those were fixed could the hall be open to rent to others not the, this group okay would be it would be income coming in at least three months out of the year and um if all of those fire marshal codes were fixed it sounds to me like you really um you as a select board want to separate the building from the fire station and have it managed or owned by somebody else um we don't want to put a lot of time into putting our little uh, plan together about what it would cost to open it up and what the current expenses are and what the income could be. It sounds like it sounds we like should we just should drop just the whole drop idea. The whole Am I idea. correct? Am I correct? That's not quite how I understood it. Pardon me? what we need to understand is what it would cost to run that building so the conversation was over figuring out what the heat bills are and the expenses are right. and how you use that data since it's such a minimal use to try to expand on what that would cost the town if it's going to cost us twenty thousand dollars to heat that thing in the winter time we're probably not going to be too apt to say yeah go ahead and make a couple hundred dollars on rent so the well, issue is, I think, is what is that cost going to be to the town before we're willing to say yes to something like that? But the other topic that's out there is separating it from the fire station. And that came up while we were out there, you know, for folks that don't understand, the power comes into the hall, then goes through the hall and out the hall to the fire station on another panel in the back. And the communication lines do the same, and the firemen have to go out of the fire station into the hall to use the bathroom and to have their meetings because when the hall when the fire station was built there was no bathroom built in it so some of this is just making that fire station so it's functional and they don't have to involve two but also if it's going to be extremely expensive to heat that hall in the winter time the option to drain the pipes and shut it down for the winter time ought to be there without impacting the fire department so I think we've got to have all that data in front of us to make a decision on that. Okay, well, we'll go ahead with our, our 
presentation that we want to give to you. If, if possible, we'd like to do it next month. And you'll have the information about the costs, I guess, from somebody. Well, we'll have what we can. And I know, yeah. and I know, there's nothing we can't we can't predict what what heating's going to cost in the future. Um, but your rental fees can go up along with all of those costs. Right now, you've got nothing coming in to way to no revenue coming in at all to help waylay any of those expenses. So we, I know there could be a lot more revenue coming in for this building. Um, we, we just, we, we, as a committee, we turned down in October, we sent four different people away that wanted to know about they could rent the building for a meeting or for a day. So I think there's, um, I think there's more, with a lot of marketing now and things like that, I think there's a lot of things that could happen. So we'll, anyways, I want to take up any more of your time. And uh, we'll lovely. bring what we can. We are not asking for funds. We were trying to come up with the funds ourselves um, yeah, and to it's help what... with the town because you've got a lot on your platter. Okay. So next, if we could be on the agenda for next meeting, we'll try and get the documents together and get them to the select board prior to the meeting. I think we'll look, let's wait and see what we can gather on the rest of them, of the costs on the, from the town side. And then if well, we can get to, the two we're together. We're going to need that information anyways. And so I'm not, I'm saying we're not going to put it on the agenda until we know everybody's going to have the information together they need to put okay. all of it on. Okay. And then we can look at that. All right. Any other? I like to give myself deadlines. <laughs> oh, you can. <laughs> we'll let you. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? I guess what I was going to offer is that Betsy's right. There's a lot of rental opportunity. And we know from the chamber that we have a lot of requests for meeting rentals and um, party rentals and wedding rentals. And it seems to me that the revenue that the committee could accrue through their marketing abilities and management could offset all the costs you're talking about in the carry. And I certainly can understand the size of the building and the condition it's in. If it were to be closed down from January 1st to March 31st, they wouldn't lose an incredible amount of revenue over the winter. But to have those other nine months of the year available for rental and availability of that space, I'm sure they could cover the <coughs> expenses and costs that it takes to carry that building. And so it would offer a really nice yeah. additional Andrea, um, they're looking for volunteers on their committee to help them come up with their plan. They won't let me volunteer for do. anything else. <laughs> but, I'm know, fully supportive with what they're doing. There, so. with, with East Randolph okay. in a, a, another growing community, I know there'd be more use in the future than you've seen in the past. And we desperately need community space within our area. So that would be um, a good one to add to it. And is there any money out there through Efficiency Vermont to help with some of the utilization <coughs> that's needed there? Not on that one, probably. No. But okay. Okay. We're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is an appeal, signed permit appeal from Poulin. Uh, Mark Good is on here. He's your sign officer. The sign ordinance sends the appeals of the sign officer's decision to you as the select board. So here we are tonight. You have materials from Mark in there. He can take you through any of those. Justin's here as well to answer any questions you might have about anything he's supplied or, or to hear his perspective. And that's the general queuing up for why we're here. Okay, so um, there was a, a sign permit applied for, was denied. The appeal that came in was based a lot on that it was an agriculture activity exempt from the sign. I believe I heard that Mark did some follow-up with the agency at Ag on that. Hey, Mark, are you, you want to jump on maybe? Yes. Okay. So 
Yes, we did follow up. Uh, just to put it all in a, in a nutshell, uh, the uh, Justin came in on the, uh, and applied for a sign permit for the splitter island at 1212A, 25th of August. Uh, we reviewed that. I think he kind of knew going into it based on our conversation that was going to be a problem. There's a long history of sign issues uh, on the splitter island. Um, but his long term objective was to be able to exercise his rights to be able to express an opinion to maybe change uh, the policy in the future. And he recognized the need to follow procedure to do that. So he applied for a permit uh, in this case for a temporary sign. And he and he. Uh, uh, the, the permit was processed on the 25th. On the 30th, I denied the sign based on uh, this, the standard language in the, the sign ordinance, which was updated in 2020, in part because of the longstanding history of issues in this splitter island. Um, but also the, the, the ongoing commercial activities and established businesses don't have the ability to, to put any signs there ever. Um, and so so Justin's uh, primary argument for uh, for the appeal was that he he is neither an ongoing commercial activity or an established business. So he reached out to the uh, to folks at the state. The state responded, provided a letter back, um, and, and that letter stated that you are in fact a, a a farm. You're you're also a small business farm, um, but according to RAPS, you still have to follow the rules and guidelines of the municipality. And uh, they concurred that a farm is, in fact, um, an established business. So um, the the permit was uh, the sign permit request was denied. Okay, and so your appeal is based on why. Why do you feel you don't have to follow the sign permit? So I, I disagree with Mark's interpretation of the letter from the Department of Agriculture. Um, they did not state that we're an established business. They s did state that we're a farm, but that's a, as far as they went. Um, so in regards to zoning, um, specifically building requirements, farms are exempt from loan local zoning regulations. You can pretty much mm -hmm. build whatever you want as long as it's related to the farm operation. Um, and furthermore, the legislature just passed, I think it's 145 or 165, that allows for um, on-farm accessory uses that um, a lot of farms are doing um, agritourism type activities where they're hosting weddings or um, you know on-farm events that aren't necessarily farm oriented as much as it is just bringing people to the farm. So, um, and that a lot of people were having trouble with local municipalities saying um, those activities weren't allowed. So, have you been told they're not allowed? No, the Act, okay. Act 165 gave exemptions to those act type of activities from local right, zoning. But the appeal is over the sign. Right. So, um, so my opinion is that we're not a commercial business or an established business. So we should not fall under the same guidelines as um, the local gas station or um, you know, we're advertising our agriculture operation. Is a farm exempt from the sign ordinance? There's no specific language anywhere in the state currently that specifically refers to that. So it's, it's mm -hmm. a, a difficult it's may, I, may, may I interject? So the, the letter from the state says, uh, and I quote, the farm operation determination does not exempt the farm from compliance with any provisions of the RAPS or any other laws or regulations. So it does in fact state that even though you are deemed a farm, you still have to, you still have to follow uh, the, the rules and regulations, and in this case, also the sign ordinance, uh, uh, regardless. And to go, and again, just, just for argument, just for clarification, uh, Act 143 uh, is, uh, is called the accessory on farm business. And you're right, the, the, the Act 143 was established in 2018, and the idea was to help farms generate revenue uh, so they can be viable businesses, which is 
awesome, and we, we totally support that. However, the right on the title page of the act, uh, it says that the, the farm must meet municipal requirements that are in place for any other business in the municipality. So again, 143 is designed to absolutely promote business. The municipality can't stop you from having uh, another business on your, on your farm, and they want to. Uh, however, they make it clear, uh, and they bend over backwards to make it clear that you still have to follow the guidelines of other businesses. Uh, they're just they're just making it clear also that they have your back, just like the town has your back, to be able to have other ideas, have other uh, other ways to make sure the farm is viable. But Act Forty Three, and no, I mean it is it is it is crystal clear in terms of what it says. And then if you go to the wraps. Which, uh, which is the, the program that farms must follow, um, it's very clear in RAPS that there's, there are no exemptions in RAPS at all, aside from uh, spreaders and how they can spread their manure in the wintertime on, a, on, a, on an individual basis. So I, I respectfully disagree uh, with, uh, with Justin. But the, the RAPS do give specific exemptions in regards to building zoning. And but we're, the question in here tonight is a sign. No, I understand and it that. sounds like the, but it's, it's, it's kind pretty of, clear you got to follow the same rules as everybody else. Well, if you look at your packet, there's a lot of pictures that I said, did you get these? Mark said he was going to include them in your handout. He did send them along. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I stopped them. somebody from putting a sign in there on Saturday as I was leaving. The but there's, um, our signs we take down every night. We're only, they're only up when they're open. There's many signs throughout town that stay up all the time, full time. I guess I'm going to say yes. We probably have an enforcement issue, but I'm still not seeing where you feel like because your neighbor <coughs> has a sign up longer than you would like, that means you get an exemption. I'm well, not my, seeing my, in my or anything that there's an exemption for you. My argument is it's not clear that we're a commercial business. And if you look at other zoning issues, that farms are exempt from those from other businesses, that other businesses are obligated to follow. So and, to and this issue hasn't come up on a state level um, for them to, to really make a clear determination. Um, and at, I did at the Farm Bureau meeting the other night propose um, uh, a, a uh, proposal that the state look at this issue and address it um, because there's not clear language within the state um, to allow, you know, to clarify this either from the zoning administrator's part or from the farm's part. But it sounds like language that says you have to follow all the other municipal rules is pretty clear. No, so the, the I'm happy to send those over to you, Justin, uh, and to just so you see, I can highlight in yellow where uh, where each of these are very specifically uh, written within wraps within within Act 143, and I'll also point out that it says that uh, in 143 that receiving a farm determination does not override the need to consult and work with the town. Um, and so every step of the way, while the state wants to help uh, maintain the viability of farms, they're also saying that on one hand, uh, they, they, they totally want your business to succeed. On the other, they want to make sure that you work with the local government to be able to achieve that. And that's, a, that's exactly what we're trying to do. I understand your, your frustration. Uh, you've mentioned how it's important for you to have a sign there because it, it brings uh, spontaneous business to to uh, to your accessory business. But what we're saying is the the sign ordinance was put together. Uh, there, there was a lot of thought and effort put into it, and there are only two places in the sign ordinance that are very specific, and one of which is where you are you are you're trying to fight. Uh, to, to put a sign, and I don't think you're going to find there's going to be any luck there because uh, there, there are many issues uh, in that space that create problems. Traffic, there are accidents that happen there all the time. Uh, the, the town is constantly pulling up signs there, and we've, 
I've, I've really expressed an interest to the town and, and asked them to, to be lenient on your signs there because I really want to work this out with you. I don't, I don't want you to feel like we don't support your farm. What I want to do is come to terms with this so we can focus on the next part, which is your, uh, your words and your interest to perhaps change the policy in the future. We, we don't have the resources to be able to go on and argue these, these, this point over and over again. It's where we're, we're short staffed. Trevor is tired. Um, this, this has taken the other part of my job, the economic developer job is where I can really help you. And I, I'll just be candid. This is, this has taken a, a tremendous amount of our time and I, nobody's trying to, to stymie you from having uh, from a successful business. And believe me, I want to see you do well, but you're, you're barking up the wrong tree to try to get a sign at the Splitter Island because it is crystal clear and the state is behind us and you could, you could appeal it uh, as, as, as many ways you as you want. Do you have a letter that states it's crystal clear? I don't, yes, I don't see we, what we, we, there in, in every section that you, in your appeal letter, that you argue it's you not have a clear. letter directed to you from the state that says what you just stated. The and letter that the, the state, the letter that the state sent you and me is that's very your interpretation of it. But that's well, it's not my interpretation. It's the it's, law that he just read says that you have to follow all the municipal rules. A signed ordinance is a municipal rule. What I'm asking right. you is, where do you have something that's in statute, or do you have something? Because it's your job to prove to us that you don't have to follow this, and I'm, I haven't I'm, been proven that yet. I'm using so the other exemptions that are allowed in other zoning issues, and I'm saying there but it's is not no zoning. Signs are not <clears throat> zoning. Well, a sign not, is an ordinance. It's not a zoning ordinance. It's not a zoning. It's its when own the zoning standalone is, ordinance. Huh? It's. The sign ordinance is its own ordinance. It's not part of the zoning regulations. It's not part of any of the other ordinances. It's its but own. farms are exempt from noise ordinances. Farms are exempt from, you know, hours of operation ordinances. But in this case, Justin, There's, you have a state law that says you have to follow the municipal ordinances. Justin, I've, I've, I've doubled back. I've asked numerous people. And again, I'm not trying to make your life miserable. I'm just telling you that next year, the, the town is going to start enforcing the, the, the sign ordinance and we're trying desperately to make sure everybody has a fair understanding. So next year, there aren't going to be financial fines that are assessed to people. And we just, because we don't have the resources, if you do put signs up there, the fine is going to very quickly escalate to $800 a day. And based on what I've, I've communicated or discussed with the state, you will have to end up paying them. So why don't we focus on other ways? I can put my other hat on, the economic development director hat, and help you actually figure out ways to grow your business and not argue about uh, you know, a losing battle for you because I'm 99% certain you're going to lose in this case. Now you're threatening me. No, okay, I'm just I, what I'm telling you is I want to help you. Uh, it's just, this isn't the way to do I it. I understand that, but. This is how I didn't put my sign up today. We got zero customers, zero. And I have everybody that comes in to the restaurant. We not to the restaurant to the store. We ask, and they all ninety percent of them say they saw the sign and they came out. So it does. If I cannot have some type of sign, it does make zero sense to open up the business next year, and we will not open it. Well, you have options for signs whether you get the highway sign that directs Those are them or right. whatnot. But that, that intersection is spelled out specifically in the sign ordinance for a reason, Justin. It's not a safe spot. I know, but there's a multitude signs, of signs that are there all the time. And they've been pulled up. No, some of them are still there today. They've been there for the last two weeks. Well, I know some of them get pulled up on a regular basis when some employees are on their walks. And you can go by to the wedding that happened two weeks ago. The sign's still there today. There can be signs there that are one-offs for events like yard sales, and then the sign has to be taken up. It also has to be three by three. Your sign had your sign had six square feet uh, on your application. It wasn't three square feet. And again, it goes back to the ongoing business. We can't allow one farm 
to have an ongoing business sign in the splitter aisle and not have anyone else who wants to have their 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 business on the splitter aisle. And so this, while I feel that you believe that we are coming after you in this case, this is about a uniform, fair and equitable rule it's not for everybody. And fair. You have Liberty Orchard who has two signs, one on Ridge Road and the other one is right at the intersection of BTC. And though there is not both I, they're both I'm in the town right away and they're both over the six foot size. And that business isn't even in town. So you there, are being unfair and unequitable. That that is not true. There again, I we don't have, have still to be a close. maple that has over a 20 foot square sign that's permanently in it's an off-premise sign and it's it's adjacent to the it's in the town right away and it's there permanently. And I think you heard him say, Justin, that they're educating everybody on these signs right now and they're gonna start enforcement next year on them. Okay, can I, can I say something? Go ahead, Perry. Can I get in here? So I think Justin's right in, in a number of cases regarding the signs that are all around the all around the town. Okay. And for businesses that aren't even in the town. And as somebody who sat on the planning commission and worked on the side and ordinances, I can tell you right now, we never anticipated that this kind of situation was going to happen. So my suggestion is that we take Mark's suggestion and we work on the policies and try to figure out if there's a way that we can figure out how to make people comply with the signed ordinances. And maybe we've got to change the signed ordinances again, okay, to get this little part of the signed ordinance fixed because there's a lot of violators. I don't think anybody's intentionally violating, but you know, these signs are beneficial to their businesses. And I'd like to find a way to, to continue to get these businesses the kind of support we need because we don't really need to lose anymore. Okay, we're starting to build back some here, and I'd love to figure out how we can support them. And I think Mark is right, so we can figure out how to change that. We've got, you know, we've got a few months here. We're going to go into the winter season, and I think we could probably make this a priority for the planning commission to go in and revisit this and take some, you know, get some input on what we think is okay. And, you know, you've got to deal with the whole state side of this thing because the state's the one that creates the basis to the sign rules. I mean, that's why we have no billboards. And I'm happy we don't have billboards, but we also have to find ways for businesses to be found. OK, and the state signs don't always do it. And I know that for a fact, because for years I lived with the same problem. So I think it's time to send this back to the Planning Commission and get some public input and, and get Mark's assistance on how to maybe make this more palatable for everybody. Because and I don't this, see anybody uh, paying 800 This is a, a, a Sonny Holt from the Planning Commission. We'd be glad to take that on. Thank you, Sonny. Trini, I just want to state I'm not here to badger with Mark. <clears throat> Mark, at the beginning of this process, told me that I had to follow procedure, and that was by submitting the application. And then he told me that it's going to get denied, and then I would need to appeal it. So I was following what Mark wanted to do, or suggested that I do. And that's what I'm doing. We are closing this weekend for the winter. So after this weekend, it's really a non-issue. Um, but next summer, I would like to be able to do something, because we feel it's important for the success of it to, to, for our business to work. Um, and hopefully the planning commission will will feel that same way but I one, uh, one thing i'd like to add uh is the sign ordinance uh, took account for uh traffic safety okay the splitter island uh, is one of the most uh, traffic intense areas in the town it's where 12a meets uh, 12 okay so uh, any signs in there, uh, if people are taking their eyes off the road, looking at signs in that area, it, it's a hazard, uh, especially if that sign is, is too small to read. And the, and the planning uh, commission took that into account uh, for any areas where there might be a traffic hazard if people had to slow down and try to read something. So there shouldn't be any signs at all in, the, in that island. Trevor's that state property. The island understood it to be ours, our property inside the state's right of way. 
that we should have given up and let them put a T intersection there years ago. Right. Okay. So on the appeal, based on what we've been presented, do we have to act on it or do you want to withdraw it because you don't need to sign? I, I would prefer you act on it. That way I have the opportunity to appeal to the state if I need to. The, just for the record, the way, the way it sets, these are the, the appeal here is a, it's a binding appeal. The matter is, the matter is finished. The, what you would take up with the state would be something entirely different on your own. Um, in terms of, well, I can appeal to the environmental court your decision. Yeah, you can. You can. No, any select board decision can be appealed. Not any. Not any. You think many of, of a zoning based decision? This would be about the regulatory power. So if there's a court process for this, it would be through a, one of the different courts. Superior court, right? It? So just zoning would be environmental court? Right. Land use related stuff would go to the environmental court. So okay. a DRD decision, a zoning permit, those types of things would go environmental court. You could try. <laughs> so do you want us to rule on it or you don't want us to well, rule what, on it? Well, what's it going to hurt to have you rule on it? I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you the opportunity yeah, to no, go either rule, direction. Rule on it, please. All right, so we have a signed permit appeal. Any other testimony on it? Any other information? Not seeing any. Anybody want to make a motion on it? Is it a motion or is it just a? Well, it's set up here as a agenda item. Yes, uh, not just to be just to be clear. The the select board has fifteen days to deliberate and, and issue an opinion. Uh, on findings of fact that we can we can we can mail that to uh, to Justin. Uh, we don't have to. The board doesn't have to render an opinion tonight. You basically have two options for a motion. One is to uphold the appeal and to grant the application. The other one would be to um, deny the appeal, and that would stand with the sign ordinance officer's decision. So you'd be upholding Mark's decision if you deny the appeal. You uphold the appeal and grant. You essentially be granting the app the application, and those are the those are really the two choices. It is. I don't really have a third okay. path. Okay. But you do have the fifteen days to do it. But it's those are the that's what you're trying to weigh out. Okay. I, I guess I was just wondering about procedurally whether it's something which actually requires a motion to to. Uh, yeah. Because. It's not quite a quasi-judicial like, process, but it is cleanest if you end it with a motion so that there is some sort of action, so that if there is an appeal avenue for the appellant, it creates that kind of due process framework um, as well, because you've taken action, so there's been staff action, now there's been an appeal, there's been the action to uphold, or to stay with the sign officer's <coughs> decision. Um, the motion could be to the action we want to take and then to issue a formal notice within the 15 days allowed to, right. yeah, so to allow written. for the preparation of a, like this is what it was based on. Yeah, uh, yeah, a lot like a DRB decision would be one way or the other where it maybe even lays out sort of, here's the process, here are the findings, here's the conclusion of the board, and then whatever your decision is gets inserted there. We do that with doc hearings, for example, um, okay. for those same due process reasons. This one's full of some municipal wonkery with regulatory police powers and <laughs> land use and appeal pathways. <laughs> it is. It's a fun one. Do you want to take action tonight? You have 15 days. I think we should just take action and move on. Yep. I agree with you. Um, Justin, I just would like to say that I've, I've, I've been to your establishment for creamies twice and enjoyed them very much. I'm glad that you're there. I think it's an important business and I've seen what you've done with that property over the last several years and it's been a, a big improvement um, and I really deeply appreciate the effort that's gone into it and, and the economic aspect that it brings to the town. Um, at the same time, I, I, it seems like this ordinance is really, really clear and uh, I don't think we have much of a, a choice, in my opinion, um, to, to deny your appeal and I would like to make that motion. 
You got Perry still on there? Yep. Perry, you're, you're muted if you're trying to pop back in there. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. All right. So All right. Larry made a motion. I'm going to second it. Is that what we're doing? We're denying it? Yes. Okay. Well, then I second the motion. Okay. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll put all that in writing for you. Okay. Thank you. Amy. Justin, Amy. just one last thing. I do want to work with you. So give me a call. We can talk about other ideas as well. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, good night. You too. Next up are assembly permits. We have an assembly permit for Halloween and another one for the 30th for pumpkin carving. Any reason we can't take these both at the same time? <coughs> I think so. Same organizers, basically, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. <laughs> complete with dancing, so I would say. <laughs> one one dance. Questions, comments, motions? Motion to approve. Is that you, Larry? <laughs> I, was, I was trying to say it's so quiet too. I was like, you're hearing you know, is really I had, yeah. That's amazing. So moved. All right, I'll make a motion to approve the assembly permits. Both of them. Thank you. Oh, that, that was easy. Larry already does it. That was easy. <laughs> we'll give you the second. I'll get the second. I'll, I'll be happy to second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Other business. I don't have any for you. No other business. I have a question. Report. If you, if you don't mind, just going Is back to on the going back to the farm sign. Does he have the option to appeal to any of the adjacent business owners? No. No. Okay. He's a way. Option he's got a good idea. Appeal it in court. Uh, okay. Needs to find a different that, spot. For your neighbor's not That's judging, what I wondered. Is if he judge, in that. Yeah. Spot. Oh, is there you a mean neighbor? talk to the, the, the gift store or the gift to, store? Or oh, Mojo. you could go and talk to somebody Would else. But then it's still him? an offsite. Yeah. And yeah. can he do the state? The green signs that go on the post. Can he you do could through be trans, and some of it with this one was if that sign were the three square feet that Mark was talking about, yes. and you put it say on the gift store property, yes. and you got the permit, that all probably comports with that sign ordinance, and right. we're fine. Yeah. The, the, the problem with the splitter island, in addition to the sign being too big, the splitter island is prohibited. Totally understand so, that. So it yeah. had kind of two different. But there's enough adjacent property there that yeah. it, it might be a summary. Put his sign up. It might be yeah, affect right. visually that he could. Or All right. We, we still got a lot. We still got stuff on the agenda. So yes. we're done with that topic. Oh, thank you very much. I'm going to solve that one tonight. Come and see us report. The paving is going to be moved back. We just heard from Pike the other day, so that'll be the week of the 24th. We're expecting them to be on site with that milling machine running on the 24th, and that this will be the last change. They're following all the state specs with regards to temperature, so we're not worried about finished products. It's just about the timing, and we'd like to have a set time so that we can tell the community, other partners, like the hospital, this is what we're doing when we're doing it. You can expect to see them in front of your house, business, whatever. Um, Plan ahead, so that's still moving forward. We've been finishing up a great number of other projects. Howard Hill's done. Um, I think we've graded everything or have come really close. They've been out pothole patching. They were doing some culvert ditch line work along the way as well, getting ready for winter. So I think we've come a long way, very fast over the last month, and having that roller on the scene. They went down to Hull Street. They put nine tons out the other day, and I think. Four or five of it went right right onto Hull Street into the holes there. And there was a similar experience on was a hard race that they quite a, really quite a few there. Yeah, so we're trying to pick around sort of the side streets, some of them where we know we have large holes that are going to be addressed with the larger paving rather than dump asphalt into it just to mill it up a week and a half later. Um, so that's why anybody on Pleasant Street, yeah. I was just going to ask if it's the Pleasant Street one, is it? So I can tell my staff because I was telling them They're this week. Yeah, yes. so Pleasant Street so and Main Street later. will be part of the mill and repave. So you'll see those will be a little more extensive, take you know, a couple of days, and then everything else will be sort of shim and overlay around it. So we're not patching potholes there because we're going to do more. Right, more. but it's not happening until a week later than it was just a week set, from right? Monday. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I just wanted my staff to know so they know to 
That's not going to tell them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the staffing thing we mentioned a little bit. Paige is on here. She's the new rec director. If you haven't met her yet, um, try to find some time to stop in and say hi. Kayla is in finance doing the accounts payable, utilities billing, and has been um, a boon to our research capability. She's really good at you give her a task and oh my God. she goes and finds you what you need. Um, that, that's been a really nice addition too. Unfortunately, as I mentioned to you the other day, we lost our finance director candidate who withdrew. Um, he was due to start on Monday. We're going to get the team together in there and try to figure out what a longer term plan looks like for this diminished capacity scenario. I may have to take on certain pieces that we were holding for that role, and then Cynthia from NEMREC will take on some other pieces, and we'll thankfully have someone else in the mix now to, to handle some of the accounts payable. We may have to bring in extra NEMRIC based resources, so some contract ones. We've been using one of their other employees to help us with payroll processing, for example, so that we can keep all the regular wheels moving. But some of the stuff, to give you an example of what's been kind of held um, since the summer, it's we're talking about you know tax payment agreements and it's tax due date time. Um, so some of those things that a finance director has done, you know, in sort of a delinquent tax collector role in that case. We're going to have to figure out how to pick those up um, so that we can get those done um, sooner than later. So that was less than ideal news um, to get the other day. So it was due to some changes in commute time tide. An infrastructure project that was going to be a couple of months over two summers um, turned into an 18-month at least um, full-on bridge closure. And this person lives just across the river. Um, and so now they got to would be that, and it just didn't work um, for their schedule. They couldn't just park their car on the other side of the bridge for 18 months? And walk through the zone, yeah, I thought about that, yeah. I can I'll pitch that idea. I'll just the winger over, right? Um, and put her in the lift. Just the pole balls or something? Clean. <laughs> <Clean. laughs> How complicated could it really be? Get her heart pumping. She'll need coffee, right, if you do that. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Save a lot of money that way. Paige is there eating string cheese? Yeah, she's yeah. eating oh. string cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just some of the other stuff. We'll have the traffic ordinance, the wage schedule. Some of those things are coming. Um, reappraisal started. You'll notice the sign up on the wall. We're going to try to sit them in there. Originally, we're going to put them up in the conference room, but um, it seems like that might be a better workspace for them. So they've been on site doing some initial work. There's been some tie-ins to getting things loaded onto the server, you know, software-related, starting some of that database setup so they can begin to populate those things. As they go out and do visits later, um, do you think what else? Well, I, don't know. I think that's it. I've eaten way too many M and M's this week. I think I have a stomachache. <laughs> had probably three pounds of those, but they're getting me through. Uh, that's too, probably too much sharing, but dark chocolate. They're very good. They're dark. Yeah, if they're dark, it's okay. It's okay. It they're is? antioxidant rich, so it's actually I'm doing it's healthy stuff. It's healthy food. Or yeah. vegetable. Um, I don't think there's anything else really right now. We're, We've been able to chop quite a bit of stuff off our list just with having that one extra body in finance so we can take some front-end stuff, how it sort of ripples out. So each time we add a piece somewhere, that does help us come up. Having pages a week and a half in, but just having her on scene, you know, just how these things start to tumble out. So, Positive um, energy. Yeah, and so it's hard to lose somebody else, and it means we'll have to carry those tasks for a while longer. But... I think because we're starting to buttress everywhere else and fill up, hopefully it's a little more doable. That continues to be the, the struggle point. And we're in a market for a position that Montpelier's looking for one right now. Um, Westminster's looking for one right now. There's a couple places across the river that are our, um, and then some different other roles that are out there. And it's a small pool to begin with, so we'll see. So if you know anybody who may have an interest in municipal finance, some kind of background in those pieces, um, <coughs> send them our way. We'd certainly consider somebody with all the technical chops, because we can, the municipal pieces are kind of wonky, but we can certainly train somebody up on, on those. They're not, we're not talking about rocket science. We're talking about 19th century law in a lot of cases. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have an appreciation for the archaic, but not any real technical law knowledge. <coughs> but, so yeah, anybody knows, send them on. Um, but we're, get, we're, we're closer, is the positive. A little grayer. <laughs> Could be the kids though, so who knows? It's the kids. It's the kids. Yeah, well, they're not. They shouldn't. Well, they're they're not here, here, so we'll yeah. blame it on them. Okay, sounds fair. <laughs> that's all I have for you. I don't. I think that's. I'm trying to remember if there's anything else that came up this week, but 
No. Okay. Did you come for a specific item? Just oh, to enjoy not, it? He's not here. He fills up. <laughs> Oof. We gotta find you some fun things to do in town. <laughs> We're gonna put him to work. I've got some ideas for him. Yeah, you know, we we okay. probably get better participation from the public if we do this on a Friday night, because there's would be that other thing to do when you don't know what else to do on a Friday. Only night. if we provide drinks. I would say you could have a beer garden and yeah. a few other things. And we're not allowed to do that. Up. So I mean, well, there's nothing that says we can't. No, that's what Justin would say. Yeah. You have to change your policy. <laughs> it's just policy. It's just well, change. we couldn't do it here. Oh, we just do it somewhere. We just got to do it off site. Yeah. Then you could. Yeah. All right. Anything you're at the for Weebird, they just not a first class license. That's right. Should we ask her? You should go upstairs. She's just, for sure. yeah. just looking at me like she was there. All right. Uh, anything for executive session? No. Then the next item is to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Perry said second. Even though he's muted, okay. I saw his mouth move. <laughs> That's right. Saw <laughs> the captioning. He did. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is closed. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Fun.